I'm going to let the magic happen here. How many people went to ASMS last week? This this week. This week. This week. This week. Uh, <laughs> that is to say, how tired are you? Uh, uh, the deal I'll make is if you don't fall asleep, neither will I. Okay? Uh, yes. But I know that I'm the last talk out of probably like what feels like 200 and uh, that there's drinks that are actively being prepared outside. Um, so I'm going to try and make the talk. Uh, hopefully fairly short and fairly fun and um, with plenty of rooms for questions. So if you have questions throughout, I'd love to hear them. Um, I'm going to present two stories. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated today is that it's been a very diverse mix of topics. And so it's been really exciting for me after sitting through a bunch of native mass spec talks this week. I'm kind of like, it's cool to hear about oceans and, and microbes and metals and things I don't normally think about. So I've gotten some cool ideas. I hope you'll get some interesting ideas out of this. This is definitely going to be a bit different than some of the past ones. You may say, how do I know anybody here? I've never worked in Peter Dorstein's lab. I've never lived in California. Um, actually, it is a funny story. So I was it was deep in the heart of the pandemic. I got tasked with teaching the undergrad analytical lab. I'd never taught an analytic, like any lab course before. And um, we just got a triple quad that was donated. And I'm like, I'm going to build like an LCMS experiment for them to do. And I, I was like, but I don't know how to get them to install like freestyle on their computers and like, well, how are we going to do this? So I went to Twitter as, as you did back a year or two ago. And I was like, anybody have a free program for viewing LCMS data that we could use with undergrads? And Ming said, I'm working on this cool thing. Try this website. And it was perfect. Um, so it was great to get to meet Ming and Daniel and the whole team. And uh, it's been fun to kind of get to piece into some of that ecosystem. So um, it's great to meet some people here today that I'm sure I'm co-authors with, but I never met face to face. Um, so anyway, uh, enough of that. Let's talk science. Um, so uh, I've shown here, this is an image. I don't think the laser pointer is quite working. I'll use the... Change the focus. Oh, change the focus. No, I mean the the this physical... Oh, sorry. The physical laser pointer isn't working, but there's... Oh. There's this. Okay. Um, you may have seen like mem pictures of uh, membranes that look like this. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's really dim. Oh. <laughs> I, yeah, I actually have one in my bag. I'll keep talking while I got it. You may have seen pictures of membranes that look like this, right? Um, you have all the lipids right in a row, right? Like, uh, and if you've ever done like bio render or things, you'll see lipids that look like this, right? Um, but this is, and it's a beautiful picture. It's actually a hand-drawn painting by my undergrad. Um, oh, this one's also dying. Boy, it's really the end of the um, But anyway, uh, but number, real membranes don't look anything like this, right? Uh, they're not this infinite sea of lipids spotted by these beautiful sailboats of memory proteins, right? They are complicated environments with thousands of different lipids, thousands of different membrane proteins, all these small molecules, you have glycans, all kinds of crazy things going on. Um, and this is a really complex environment to study, which makes it also really great for looking at science, right? Um, one of the things we've known for a while, but I think haven't appreciated quite so much, is that lipids can be really important modulators of membrane proteins, right? And we've known this from functional studies where you put a membrane transporter, say, in a different type of lipid environment, it behaves differently, right? but we don't really have a lot of the tools to connect the dots on that. And so there are a lot of outstanding questions on trying to understand what does it look like on this interface of the membrane and the membrane protein, right? So we don't know, for example, how membrane proteins remodel their local lipid environment, right? To select for different lipids out of the bulk, right? We don't know how lipids affect the membrane protein structure and function, except in a couple of very select examples, right? And we also don't know really where lipids are binding, right? And what those binding profiles look like. What does that selectivity look like? I think from sort of a structural perspective, which residues are involved in this binding. Um, and I think kind of big picture wise, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is how do we make these connections between the proteome and the lipidome and sort of the, not just, you know, we have good tools for measuring the lipidome. We have good tools for measuring the proteome, but we don't know how lipidomic changes then feed back to affect protein function, right? So in cancer, we know, lipids change a ton, right? We know there's also changes in the proteome. We don't know if lipids are changing in a way that's then affecting protein function. I, and, and there are actually a few really cool examples where we see that like in cancer, a certain type of lipid gets changed and that's affecting uh, 
say, growth factor signaling, right? By affecting the way the growth factor receptors work, it might happen in oceans that like phosphate levels change and that changes the lipidome and that's affecting then phosphate transporter activity. So those sort of questions, we're trying to develop tools to answer that. Okay, enough biology, let's talk mass spectrometry. Um, so here's how we do it. So one of the techniques we're developing in our lab, we call it lipid exchange mass spectrometry. Um, the idea is basically that we're gonna take these um, lipid nanodisks, they're called. So a nanodisk contains a lipid bilayer and it's surrounded by this membrane scaffold protein. Um, this membrane scaffold protein is derived from ApoA1. So these are basically synthetic HDL particles. We can engineer them. We make these in the lab. We have high school students that come by and learn to do this. They're very robust. They're really nice systems. What we can do then is we can solubilize a membrane protein in this little nanoscale lipid bilayer, right? And this is a great tool for doing things like cryo-EM and other things. And my lab's been working with these with Native, which we're not really going to talk about today. Um, but the idea basically is that if you take this nanodisc and you mix it with another type of nanodisc, say down here, over time, the lipids will hop back and forth and they'll exchange. This is just a passive diffusion process. Um, and we could talk more about the mechanism in the question if you'd like, but it's it just over a few days, the lipids hop back and forth. And so our hypothesis was that if you let these sit until they reach equilibrium, if the membrane protein binds a certain type of lipid, it's going to perturb that equilibrium, right? It's Le Chatelier's principle, Gen Chem, right? And so if we see enrichment of a certain type of lipid in the protein disc relative to the non-protein disc, that will tell us something about the binding affinity. In fact, we can actually work out real binding constants of lipids in the membrane to the membrane protein from this data. And so we did this back in 2000 with two synthetic lipids, which is great because we could kind of titrate the ratios and find like an optimal binding condition. But really over the last few years where, where we've been pushing is to try and say, there's no reason you can't do this with lipidomics, right? So let's take say any e. coli membrane protein like this aquaporin Z, which is a water transporter. Um, let's put it in E. coli polar lipids, which are basically extracted lipids from its natural system. Um, let's build another nanodisc also with E. coli lipids and let's let them exchange. Let's pull them apart. We'll do lipidomics. We use LC, MS, MS. We're doing DDA to build the library. And then we just do MS1 quant because that for us is the most accurate. Um, and then after that, we're going to quantify the relative ratio of lipids in this disc versus this disc. And I'm just going to show you a little piece of the data today. We've done more proteins and uh, including some human pro or some eukaryotic proteins as well in brain lipids. Uh, but I'm going to show you the, the piece today with the aquaporin Z because I'm going to talk about it also in the second half of the talk. So here's what the data looks like that we get. Um, and what you can see, this is log two full change and log P value, right? We get a, a handful of lipids that go up and we get a handful of lipids that go down. And it tends to be that the PE lipids go down and the PG and the cardiolipins go up, right? So this is definitely a case where the protein is binding PG and cardiolipin. In this case, we actually really don't see any tail preferences. Uh, we did a lot of analysis to see are the lipid tails longer or shorter or different levels of unsaturation. We don't really see that. Uh, we do see that with some of the other proteins, though. Um, as I've mentioned, what we can then do through a series of math steps that I'm not going to describe, but you can go read in this paper, we're actually able to take the log two-fold change and convert it into a delta G of binding, right? Which kind of flips the axis because a uh, negative delta G means a positive affinity, right? So, but you can see it just sort of looks kind of like a flipped version of this. And we get kind of binding affinities on the order of kind of like minus two kilojoules per mole, which is actually fairly small, but it's enough to establish, you know, some amount of binding specificity for this protein. And we actually know that cardiolipins are important for the function. If you take like any, a cardiolipin deficient strain of E. coli, the, this protein doesn't work as well, right? So I think, um, you know, I'm not presenting a ton of biology here, but just trying to get across what I think is a really cool method. Uh, we're working with this in a lot of different directions, but I think it kind of gives us a platform for basically trying to say, you know, conventional lipidomics gives us what lipids are there. We're trying to say what's actually surrounding and touching the protein and which lipids might then be important to follow up with, right? Okay, so I mentioned cardiolipin is important for this protein, both functionally, and we know that it binds in the context of a really complex natural mixture. The question then becomes, where does it bind, right? Uh, which residues is interacting? Are there specific sites of interaction? How specific are those sites? And there's a couple ways you could potentially try and solve this. One is that you could solve the structure, right? There's a lot of cool people doing cryo-EM and x-ray crystallography, right? We actually tried to do this. We got a beautiful structure in nanodisks, in like complex lipids. 
3.2 angstrom, which if you don't do structural biology, that's like awesome. Uh, zero lipids resolved, right? So great resolution of the protein, no lipids, which is to say this is a very difficult thing and you may not even get it to work even in the best case of scenarios. Another thing you can do is molecular dynamics. And we are doing some of this as a way to kind of map potential lipid binding sites. It's great, but it's limited in how complex you can do and you kind of need to validate it, right? It's a, it's a simulation, it's not experimental data. The final thing you could do is that you could make, you know, a series of measurements where you measured in a wild type version, the KD, and then you measured in a mutant version, another KD. And then you could say, are the ratios of these two different? What's the relative affinity? Um, and you could use that to try and localize binding sites. And, and if I had an infinite number of graduate students, maybe we would do it this way, but that's a lot of work. You have to do a, a bunch of titrations. Now, error can kind of compound as you go through that process. Um, so we wanted to try and de design an experiment that was a little bit smarter um, and that took advantage of the resolution that we have in mass spectrometry. And so the basic idea is with high resolution native mass spectrometry, I know you've heard a little bit about this this morning. I'm going to talk, I'll get in the next slide, I'll get into exactly how we do this. But basically, we're able to measure lipid binding to the protein, right? This is just mass as a func you know, mass, and we see lipid bound. Each lipid that binds gives us an extra little bit of mass. Um, but we can not only measure lipid binding, but if we have a mutant in there, I think it clicked. There we go. Um, we can measure both the mutant and the wild type simultaneously because the mutant has a slightly different mass, right? So what it means is that in the same tube, we can probe both the mutant and the wild type. And from this one spectrum, we can work out the relative affinity. So I'll walk through how this is done, um, especially because I know many people here may not have heard of native mass spectrometry or may not be super familiar with that. Uh, the basic idea is we start by mixing our mutant and our wild type. Um, we're going to mix them with cardiolipin at about a 1 to 1 to 100 ratio. We're doing this in detergent because it's easy in native mass spec to strip off the detergent, leave just the protein lipid complex behind. Uh, we do this in ammonium acetate because it's a nice, neutral, volatile buffer. Um, so we put our protein and our lipids in detergent in ammonium acetate. We stick them directly into the mass spectrometer, just direct infusion with nano electrospray. Um, we're going to do this with a variable temperature ion source, which means we jacket our electrospray needle with um, a thermal um, block, and we control that with um, this Peltier device, which means we can actually set the temperature of our experiment. Um, we do this actually at different temperature steps and do Van Hoff analysis, and that's a lot of physical chemistry for what's the end of a long week. So we're not going to go too deep into that. But um, this is what our data looks like. This is some raw data here. You can see we have a lot of peaks. That's because we have different, we have mutant and wild type, we have different amounts of lipid bound, and we also have different charge states, right? And we normally we want to remove the charge states because we don't really care about that. So that's where we use our software Unidec. Um, if anyone's looking for sort of a, a low res deconvolution algorithm, I think it's the best. It's pretty fast. It's fully open source. It's free. You can use it anytime. Um, so it's great. And it's been fun to sort of connect this with MassQL and some other tools that we've been playing with. Um, so anyway, we take that, that goes from M over Z into mass. And you see that's where we can then assign not just mass, but number of bound lipids. So each lipid that binds shifts the mass to different series. Everybody good? Nobody's falling asleep. Good. All right. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take this data. It's lagging a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, let's just focus in on these two peaks right here, right? So this is the mutant in the wild type without lipid bound and with lipid bound. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the peak areas of those and we could say the peak area is sort of proportional to the concentration of the unbound and the bound form. This is just a typical KD equation, right? From these measurements, we know kind of this ratio. What we don't know is the amount of free lipid, right? Um, we'll come back to that in a second. We can do the same thing for the mutant, um, where we basically say, let's take the mutant form, mutant with, oh, it's almost fully locked. Yep. Uh, okay. I'm just going to not touch it. Um, the mutant with and without lipid ligand. Um, again, we don't know the free ligand, but it's in the same tube, right? So it's the same amount of free ligand in both equations, which means when we take the ratio of those two, it drops out of the equation. And so basically now we have is we have the ratio of bound and unbound on one, the, the wild type, the ratio and bound and unbound on the other, the mutant. So far, so good. Um, that actually corresponds to this chemical formula, where basically on one side of the equation, 
you have the wild type holding onto the ligand. And on the other side of the equation, you have the mutants. So it's just the tug of war, basically, between those two things, right? Um, we can then convert that into a delta delta G, which basically says when we make that mutation, how much is that affecting the delta G of binding, right? So if we see it go up, it means it's more unfavorable. If we see it go down, we mean it means it's more favorable. Cool. You guys are are real champs. Uh, here's what we get out of this. So here's the actual like peak area data that we get. You can see it's really nice. And you can immediately see on this that the blue mutant doesn't bind lipid as well, right? So it's not as favorable for lipid binding because the distribution has shifted more towards zero, right? If we look at that set of peaks, we can see that the value is a positive 0.86. We can go, this one's about close to one. It starts to go a little further down. We're going to plot those typically as these sort of bar charts here. And you can see for each lipid that binds, we actually get a separate delta delta G value. And you can see as we bind more lipids, it kind of goes down. We think that's because there's potentially multiple places that lipid could bind, and we're sampling sort of multiple sites as we go to higher amounts of bound lipid, right? Okay. So we actually just had that initial paper accepted, showing that method, doing a few mutants. Um, for lots of reasons, it's been under review for like nine months. But in the meantime, um, what I, what the students did, I was sort of like, you know, how many mutants do you think you could make? And a uh, second year graduate student for HANA was just like, I'm going to make them all. And so she didn't make all of them, but she really tackled a ton of mutants. You can see this is 14 mutants. Um, I think she said she actually made 28. So we still have a few more that we're in the process of analyzing. Is a few that we've kind of given up as not interesting. Um, but this is our set that we have at the moment. So basically, this is kind of called alanine scanning. She went through and just changed a bunch of residues to alanine. Uh, this is a tetramer, a homotetramer. I kind of forgot to mention. So this is actually, you know, you're seeing kind of like one face of this, but it's kind of repeated all the way around the protein. You'll see some examples later. It really covers a lot of the surface area of the protein. And the idea was, let's just look at the delta delta Gs as a function of mutation site and see if we get hot spots for where the lipid might be binding. And so here's kind of what that data looks like. Oh, sorry. Um, the other thing that we did was also not just do one lipid, one cardiolipin. We did another cardiolipin with slightly longer tails. And then we also did phosphatidylglycerol and phosphatidylethanolamine, two different lipids with that are also in E. coli membrane. So we wanted to see not just where is it binding, but also what's the selectivity for different lipids. All right, here's what the data looks like. So this is with uh, 160181 cardiolipin. You could see we have a pretty strong peak for the W14A. Uh, it's the data I showed before. As we go through, there's a handful of residues that show fairly strong values, but it, it kind of dies off. We do have one residue, this uh, blue one down here, this F196, that actually is favorable. So making that mutation means lipids bind more strongly, which is kind of interesting. So then we started to look at the other data. So that was one. Okay. Uh, That's the, this is now the slightly longer lipid. You could see it's a similar profile. It's not exactly the same. There's a handful that are slightly different. Um, but in general, it's a fairly similar profile. We've kept the order consistent of all of these. So you can kind of see. Um, then we have the POBG, and immediately you'll notice it does not really, it, it's not really being affected quite as much by these mutations. We also just, like, if you look at the amount of lipids bound, it's not as many. So we know that it's not binding as tightly, and also that these mutations are not really affecting it much. And interestingly, also, the POBE shows a fairly similar profile where it's pretty flat. And we've mapped all of those onto the structure down here where the colors kind of match. And you can see, you know, if you look at these two structures, we have hot spots. Whereas if you look at these two structures, you really don't. I mean, there's this slight site down here, but that's consistent through all of them. So I think what this is telling us, oh, now that's up there. Okay, good. Um, we're seeing specific binding for cardiolipin. We're not really seeing dramatic differences between the, the two different tails. For the PG and the PE, we're really not seeing any specific sites of interaction, which I think is pretty interesting that it really is like we are getting specificity for cardiolipin. We are getting it kind of at that monomer interface site. Um, and we're not really seeing any other specific sites for these other two lipids. Um, so I think, you know, we're seeing some interesting stuff right around sort of the these positively charged residues on the top around this sort of monomer monomer interface. And then also there's this site down here, which we did not expect. And um, Basically, we're also seeing on the molecular dynamics that that seems to be lighting up, and it's not really clear why. And so I think one of the interesting things, we kind of went in predicting that we'd be able to say, like, you know, 
these lysines and arginines that were positively charged were really important in binding this negatively charged cardiolipin, and we really don't see that. It's uh, actually a lot more of these hydrophobic residues are playing more of a role in a way that we really don't understand. So I think basically, you know, this is a really detailed study looking at kind of this model protein, um, but I think it's showing us that there's a lot that we don't understand about how lipids and proteins interact and what that selectivity profile looks like. And so I think hopefully going forward, some of these tools will be useful in solving other systems and trying to look at other proteins. We're always interested in trying to find new targets, uh, trying to develop different lipidomics methods to help answer these questions. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I will conclude by thanking my wonderful group. Most of them were at ASMS this week, although they chose to drove back, uh, drive back yesterday. Um, so I presume they made it safe. Nobody uh, messaged this morning. Um, thanks to our collaborators and to our funding sources and uh, for the invitation to come, for everybody for, for staying awake through the talk. And I'm happy to, to answer questions and have discussion afterwards. So many of these transport or, uh, transporter proteins will cycle through different conformations. Have you been able to see how the lipid binding changes with conformation for any of these guys? That is a great question. I don't know how much the people on Zoom are hearing when I walk away from the mic, so I'll repeat it. it basically, are there any conformational difference, differences in lipid binding? Um, for this protein, the ammonium transporter, or sorry, this is a AQPC, uh, the aquaporin channel. Um, it's a rock. It doesn't move, um, which is kind of why we like it. Um, but you're definitely right that there are some that do massive motions, and people are starting to see that there are lipid-dependent binding. Um, and this is mostly coming from cryo-EM data, where as cryo-EM has gotten just dramatically better in the last decade, um, people are starting to see that they're seeing lipid binding in certain conformations, but not in others. Um, that's definitely hard to tell, uh, but it's hard to tell that really specifically. Um, it's something we'd like to try, and it'd be pretty easy with something like an ABC transporter to kind of lock it in, because they know certain ligands lock it in one conformation versus another. Um, we could definitely do the experiment um, if you could covalently modify them, you could even exchange two different conformation, one conformation against each and against the other, and then measure the, the lipid exchange between those, which would be really cool. Um, yeah, I have a colleague working on those. I should bug him when he get, when I get back and make him give me some protein. Yeah. Oh, good at uh, a little bit slightly different question. So the recent uh, development in the, like the, Protein structural tools such as alpha fold, for example. Yeah. Uh, did you see that feasibility of using those tools for protein liquid binding, or have you compared it completely? Yeah. So the question is about whether alpha fold will be useful. I think, um, I know I haven't checked out alpha fold three much. I know there's some tools for looking at like PTMs and ligand binding. Um, I don't think they have much about lipid binding in there uh, built into the models. Um, really that's where molecular dynamics is, is shines because you can put the protein in a somewhat complex mixture, like a multi-component mixture and let it sort of equilibrate. We're doing some of those studies. Um, the GPU processing has gotten a lot better. Like when I was in my postdoc lab, I was taking like three weeks on like a full allocation of the supercomputer. And, and now it takes three days and it, on the GPUs, it's amazing how fast it's gotten. Um, but I still think that even then, the problem with molecular dynamics is sampling, right? So you can only sample, you know, so much. And it really depends a lot on your initial random configuration of where the lipids start is kind of where they end up. Um, and so that's where I think, um, certainly for natural lipid mixtures, you're never going to be able to simulate it with enough time, but where it's really useful is validating these secondary studies or, or not really validating, but helping to complement the, the studies of the mutagenesis where we know what lipid we're looking for. We want to see where it binds. It's great for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, more a question about the nature of the binding. Because if you look at your energies, you're yeah. looking at pretty much most of the time, the most, uh, the strongest interactions are one K-cap. Yeah. It's not even a hydrogen problem. Yeah, it's super weak, right? So, so what are your thoughts there of how they actually interact? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is because, and this is something I think we didn't really appreciate. It's such a competitive environment. 
right? And like the lipids are fairly similar in structure. So like one lipid can just as easily replace another. And when you have that built into the experiment, like you see that any lipid binding site is not going to be 100% occupied with one ligand, right? It's always a competition. It's always partial specificity. Um, and so I honestly, I don't think we have the tool. I don't think we have the language as biochemists to describe what that looks like. And like, I don't think our, our classic ways of K, like describing KDs make sense. I, yeah, so that, that is to say- Distance ionine interactions. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, that plays a role. I mean, I, we know that like fluidity plays a role in all of these things and um, and somehow yet there, there are functional differences. So I don't know, I think it, that I, my, I think it's, um, it's less binary and more analog, right? So it really is sort of subtle shades of gray and how it's affecting membrane proteins. And I think it's maybe a way that biology is sort of fine tuning things under the surface or with it under the sea, maybe. Um, so, yeah, but I, I don't know. I think it's something we, it's it's a cool because even the fundamentals, I think we don't know how to talk about in a intelligent way, or maybe it's just me, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a second follow-up question. So with all the structures that have been solved, mm -hmm. uh, there's often residue or density that's left behind. Yeah. And people often think these are lipids or at least there's been some speculation. Yeah. And have you ever thought about going in and trying to see if you could fit all the lipids yeah. to those densities or yeah. in some project like that well, and recapitulating you know, examples of that yeah. here. So actually it's it's interesting. During this the scope of this AQPZ project where we made all these mutants, um, our collaborators, we did we did cryo EM, we did it initially in nanodis, they went back and did it in detergent. They solved the structure. Um, and in the detergent structure, they start to see some lipid tail densities, right? And they modeled in a cardiolipid. Um and, but they didn't, they didn't have the full density for it. So it was always speculative that like, maybe that's it. Right. Um, and the site that it binds is, is this site down here where I think clearly lipids interact, but I don't think it's the specific cardiolipin binding site. So like in detergent, maybe that's what gets structured, but I actually don't think that's the highest affinity cardiolipin binding site. And I don't think in a membrane, that actually there's much cardiolipin there because I think it's getting out competed by PG and PE. Um, so I think um, uh, we're always, uh, there's always a tension in the lab between wanting to do very detailed structural analysis and then trying to translate that back into what's happening in a natural membrane. And it's really tough to do. Um, Maybe I have a third crazy question. <laughs> What if you immobilize the protein on a column and oh. essentially use it to chromatographically separate out yep. lipids that have yeah. some interaction? So yeah. Um, so Art and Aaron Baker did that. Um, I was part of that paper, but a minor part. Um, and uh, I think it was in chemical science of maybe last year sometime. Um, the problem with that is that you, ha that's another sort of issue. You still have to do that in detergent. So you basically use different amounts or different harshnesses of the detergent to strip off the lipids that don't bind the protein. Um, and then I think the question becomes, is that what you're really looking at is which lipids outcompete the detergent, not which lipid, you know, and so there's a sort of a different environment than the bilayer where with our lipid exchange in the initial, this is all detergent stuff. So, I mean, we can't get away from it entirely, but I think it's a, it's a good technique and it sort of combines with all of these to, to help answer the question. Um, I was thinking during these talks about, could we do like a post column infusion where you could see, you know, could we stick in the membrane protein and I'm, I'm trying to calculate how much but membrane protein that would burn. That, but... that requires fast kinetics. I think in detergent, it's really fast. I mean, detergent micelles are very, very quick exchanging. So uh, how fast do we need it? Within seconds? Uh, Milliseconds. Well, actually, it depends on how long you're yeah, using. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, we'll plan this experiment later, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, good. One more question. Yeah. Uh, just you were talking earlier about using Unidec for uh, deconvolution. Yeah. 
Um, and then I noticed on the last slide you 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 had Mike Senko listed as a collaborator. Yeah. Do you use that like that charge determination or charge yeah. detection? How's yeah. that been working for you? Oh, it's great. Um, I we just had two students present on this at, at ASMS. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but um, yeah. So we've been doing uh, charge detection mass spec, which for those who aren't familiar, it's basically it's single ion mass spectrometry where you use the intensity of the Fourier transform to determine the charge. So if you get down to the single ion level, you can basically bin a bunch of, of counts and determine a mass distribution from things you normally couldn't resolve. We started that work doing nanodisks, and then we got into it trying to do lipoproteins. We were going to try and look at like the density of LDL and stuff like that, um, which has been harder than we expected. And um, But um, the really, I'm, guys, I'm such a nerd. Um, the, the really cool thing that we've been doing was is Hadamard transform sec on the front where we do multiplexed sec injections and then demultiplex them after. So for those who are younger than 30, um, you inject a bunch of peaks in a specific pattern and you can encode the sequence and then decode it afterwards. So basically what it means is that rather than waiting for most of your chromatography to, for the peak to come out, you have peaks just constantly coming out and you can really improve the duty cycle. Um, so we just put that on chem archive. It's super cool. Check out the, the video at, um, from ASMS. It's a neat, it's a neat technique and it's such classic analytical chemistry. I love it. But yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to just gush about my students. Um, yeah. All right, let's take Dr. Martin. Yeah. 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 Yeah.